Good morning, everyone. I believe we are live. Good. Let's do it. Perfect. Let me just uh, get Instagram up and running. Let me post about this on Twitter. We will be good to go. I believe the chat's working. I believe everything's working. Sometimes we're just good to go. All right. Got my mouse here. We're, we're trying to make it work. The computer's over here. Camera's over here. It says checking connection for Instagram. Come on, Instagram. Don't, don't die on me. It says chat is ready to display. Good. Looks like Instagram may not work today. That would be bad. We have a few things to talk about here. That'll be good. I'm currently waiting for Instagram to work. There it goes, good. Instagram is now working, it says we are live, perfect. Sometimes you're just lucky. Today, we have legitimate coffee. I have a few business meetings today. I had to put on my grown up pokercoaching.com shirt. So, uh, you know, it's an important day. All right, now that we're here and everything is up and running, first question that came in from yesterday was discuss big blind anti-tournaments. Really, what it amounts to is the big blind anti should not matter so much. Also, I turned up the volume again on my uh, computer for Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So let me know, please, if the volume is good. Um, I turned it up to maximum. This is as loud as it can possibly go. And if you're on Instagram, let me know if the sound's okay too. I have my little headphones in for you all. So anyway, big blind ante. Should things change? Well, a lot of people incorrectly assume that if you post the ante, that that is your money. But once you post the ante, that money is gone. If anything, the fact that you're posting the big blind makes people play a little bit better because now they're actually thinking about how much money they have in the pot, right? Whereas whenever, before they put in just a tiny big blind, they weren't really considering that that whole big, full big blind that's in the pot is theirs. So um, when there is a big blind ante, it really just doesn't change anything. The pot size is sometimes bigger, but often it's smaller. If you think about a 10-handed table, let's say, at um, 100, 200 with a 25 ante, that would be 250 chips in the ante, right? Whereas with the big blind ante of 200, that means that there is now only 200 in the ante instead of 250, right? When the ante's smaller, that should actually lead to a little bit of a tighter game. So if you're playing eight-handed, it typically works out to where you're playing roughly the same game as a regular ante in terms of money in the pot. And when you're playing shorter-handed, it often results in it there being a slightly bigger ante. D. Nelson says he feels like people defend wider now with a big blind ante. Yeah, well, they should be defending wider, and it's almost like inducing them to play better just because they think, oh, that's my money I put in the pot. But it's really not your money when it goes in. There are a few times where big blind ante does matter, and that is when you are shallow stacked. So let's think about two examples, right? Well, one, one obvious example. Let's say you're under the gun with one big blind, okay? In a normal game, you can fold and then you'll be in the big blind on the next hand. And if you win that hand, you get the antis, and you get the big blind, your big blind back, and you get your opponent's call, and you get the small blind. So you put in one, and if you win on your all-in blind hand, you get back three and a half. It's pretty, pretty good odds, right? Whereas if you have a big blind ante, that implies that at most casinos, they haven't quite figured this out yet. At most casinos, though, the ante goes in first. So if you win the pot, you get back one big blind. So in a regular game, you get back your big blind, the person's call who calls you, the antes, and the small blind. So call it, let's do like that, uh, three and a half big blinds. But if you're playing big blind ante, you get back one big blind. So what does that do? What does that mean? Well, it means getting short is way worse whenever you are playing big blind ante, especially from the earlier positions, because you know you're, whenever you're short, you need to be pushing it, right? Because you know you're going to take the blinds in the very near future. So, shoving ranges should be very different. Now, if you have one big blind, I think the optimal pushing range is something like 42% of hands under the gun. Um, we have an app for this. The FTT Poker app will tell you what it is for regular games. But I imagine it's significantly wider 
if you're playing big blind ante. Like it could be literally 100% of hands. Because then, if you think about it, if you put your hand in blind under the gun for one big blind, if you put your money in blind for one big blind, you get back the big blind, small blind, antes, and big blind, right? So again, three and a half. So if you go all in blind under the gun, you get three and a half big blinds if you win, but if you wait and blind off and take the big blind or just the ante, now you only get back one. So that's very detrimental. And that can obviously be extrapolated a bit, right? If you have two big blinds, think about it, it's the same thing. Um, in a regular game, if you're in the big blind, uh, you get two big blinds back plus your opponent's two big blinds, that's four plus the ante, which is five, and then the small blind, which is five and a half, right? That's if you have two big blinds in a regular game. And um, in a big blind ante game, one of it goes to the ante, right? So you get to the ante, your one big blind back, your opponent's call, and the small blind. So that is good for three and a half big blinds. It looks like my computer, the screensaver just turned on. First time this has happened. Um, if anyone's watching on Twitch or something, let me know if my screensaver just turned on or if anything happened. Okay, so anyway, um, same thing for three big blinds, right? Basically, you end up missing out on a big blind when you double up. And... Or, or two big blinds, two and a half big blinds, I think, when you double up, which is quite significant, right? So you want to make sure that does not happen. I believe we're streaming to Facebook, but for some reason I'm not getting Facebook or Twitch or Periscope chat, which is kind of lame. Not too sure what I can do about this. If anyone is here on Facebook or on Twitter, type... Hello, Jonathan, so that I know that you're here. I'm using a chat aggregator, and it seems to not be working for those two platforms at the moment, so forgive me for that. So anyway, Big Blind Ante really doesn't change anything unless you get very short. Stack Assassin says he got two of my books. I just replied to your post on, uh, I believe, YouTube. But um, the audio book that you're referring to, Mastering Small States No Limit Hold'em, let me find it. Uh-oh, uh I just moved my camera. One second, let me get it back to where it's supposed to be. There we go. This book, it's big, right? And there are lots and lots of charts. As you can see, lots and lots and lots of charts, right? And the question was, how do you get an audiobook like this one with lots and lots and lots of charts? And the answer is, we let you download it. There's a link in here. We're not just gonna give it out here for everyone who wants to go download all the charts for free out of my book. But you can, um, the, the link is mentioned many, many times in the um, audiobook. Whenever I do audiobooks now, I always make the graphs and the charts available for you to download. So you can get this, jlpoker.com slash mastering. It's a good book. If you've never signed up for Audible, by the way, you can get it completely for free if you never signed up. So it's a heck of a deal. You can go to jlpoker.com slash free. If anyone has any questions, let me know. Kevin says, great book. He has it. Good. I'm glad you all enjoy my work. It takes a lot of time to write a 500-page book, believe it or not, even if it does have a lot of pictures. <laughs> Ryan asks the um, classic question, does it cover online play or is it live? And you have to understand, live and online poker are the same game. Everyone always thinks they're different, but they're not. The only difference, the main difference, is that players online play better, which makes people think that it's a different game. And... Whenever you're playing any form of poker, it's very important to accurately assess your opponent's skill level, right? If your opponents are terrible, live or online, you should be playing exactly the same against them. And if they're strong GTO players, you should be playing the same against them, whether you're live or online. So the book does address both forms of poker. It also addresses cash games and tournaments. It discusses how to play lots of stack sizes. It doesn't go too deep on tournament theory, though, and tournament strategies, because that was not the scope of this book, right? Do I think cash games is different than tournament play? Um, not so much when you're deep stacked, definitely when you're shallow stacked. But all of your plays should often be uh, rooted in strong, fundamentally sound principles, right? And that is what this book teaches. I mean, it teaches you how to play your range. It teaches you range analysis, right? Let's find, like right here, we're talking about equities, how your hands do against ranges. Here you see we're playing our ranges in all sorts of different ways, etc., etc. That's what this book's about. It's a big book. It's a hard book. It's going to take you some time to get through, but it's worth it. All right. If anyone has any questions, let me know. I'm happy to answer anything you all have. What do you feel your strengths of poker coaching is compared to other sites? The other sites just give you videos for the most part. 
poker coaching is very different than all of the other training sites out there because it gives you quizzes, right? It gives you quizzes where it forces you to say what you would do. So instead of just watching someone play where you can zone out and have a beer or not pay attention, it forces you to actively pay attention to what you're doing and makes you make a decision, right? That's, that's very different than most other training sites. Also, um, we have homework. We have very, very in-depth homework. I've not seen homework like this on any site at all. I mean, I have seen quizzes out there, but no one has 250 quizzes like we have and they don't update them on a regular basis. Because, I'll be honest with you, it's hard to make quizzes. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. And most people don't want to do the work. Um, same thing with the homework webinars, right? Uh, this, the homework often takes the students three or four hours to do. And they do it because it makes them way better. It teaches them how to think about ranges. And that makes them way, way better poker players. And that's, that's what we are trying to do. So we're not trying to just have you sit there and zone out and passively absorb the content. We are trying to make you actively learn the content and yeah all that comes with the fee it's completely free to sign up for the first week and after that i think it's 39 dollars a month at the moment so um yeah that all comes with, comes with that we also have the inner circle inner circle is um if you want to step it up a bit there it's i don't know the exact price you can find it at pokercoaching.com slash inner circle we have uh office hours kind of like this actually every two weeks for two or three hours, however long they want to go, where I present on whatever topic they want me to discuss for 30 minutes. Like, let's say they want me to discuss when to continue barreling on monotone boards. We'll go through lots of examples explaining when to do it against uh, good players and when to do it against various types of bad players. And then um, they get to call in. They have a, it's a call-in show. Then they can call in and ask questions. We use um, a go-to webinar so they can see my desktop. So I go through all of their hands. And um, that's great. Kevin says, uh, you're currently at upswing. Yes, I discussed upswing a bit yesterday. I, it's, I signed up to every poker site, by the way, if that's not obvious. That should be just good due diligence for most people. All right, so I signed up for the vast majority of them. And upswing was quite basic, in my opinion. And it'll get you to be okay, right? Which is, is the goal for a lot of people. It will get you to be okay. Uh, let's see. Advice on large field free rolls. I honestly don't play large field free rolls. Sorry. I imagine most people play them as if they are just purely for free. What's the difference between four tablings and four plus tabling? Um, I don't think there's much of a difference, but as you play more tables, you have to rely more on your heads up display. What software do you use to analyze ranges? Oh, I use all sorts of programs. There, You can use um, Monker Solver. That's the most advanced one at the moment, which I do not use because I don't have a supercomputer. But I outsource the work. Very important to outsource things you cannot do yourself or don't want to do yourself. I honestly don't want to sit there grinding out calculations all day every day. Um, I also use Pio Solver, but that's thought to be slightly worse than Monker Solver now because Monker Solver does multi-way scenarios and accounts for the bunching effect, which is very nice. Then um, Flopzilla. There's my range analyzer, uh, the float the turn range analyzer, which is what I what I use to make all these charts, actually. Here you have all these charts. You know roughly what your percentages need to look like as you get better and better at poker. Like you see how we have all these colors? These explain how you play each part of your range, right? You play each part of your range differently. And it's important to break it down. And this book explains how to break it down in the appropriate proportions. What is a high in return investment in a lot for a live tournament pro? You talk to two guys who travel across the country to play $200, $500, $1,500 buy-in tournaments. Even a 400% ROI doesn't seem worth it, right? No, and most people have like 40 or 50%. In, smaller, in, in tournaments like that, as more and more players... Well, as more players play an event, your return on investment typically goes up if you are a good player. However, often the structures are quite poor in those tournaments. And that's usually a, a reason why you're gonna have 50% ROI or so. What's the name of that book? Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. You can see all my books at jlpoker.com, stands for jonathanlittlepoker.com. You can also type that in if you want, slash free. Any tips for spread limit as opposed to no limit? I've never played a spread limit game in my life, so I'm not gonna be able to give you good advice, but um, realize that as the, the pots get big, the game's probably gonna play more like limit. And I imagine people probably play um they probably use bigger bet sizes than they should on the earlier streets is it definitely okay to use my push fold app while playing on stars 
Uh, they have not banned it. I know if you use Equalab, for example, or Flopzilla, they will send you an email saying that you cannot use it. Um, but the, as far as I know, they, they have not outlawed my Pushfold app yet. We're flying under the radar at the moment. Um, also, you can just use stuff on your phone if you feel inclined. Clearly don't break terms and conditions, etc., etc. Don't do anything to get yourself in trouble. That is a fishy play. You don't even play your cards anymore. You just play your perceived range. Yeah. Definitely a good thing to do, especially against good players. Your cards matter if you have to go to showdown a lot, though. If you are against players who are going to call you down, your cards are definitely relevant. How do you combat limpers in live tournaments? Say it's 10-handed, 200 big blinds deep, two limpers, you have ace-track in the cutoff. Raised about seven big blinds with ace-track suited. Ace-track suited is great. Melker says, your books are free now? Um, you can get two audiobooks for free at jlpoker.com slash free if you've never signed up for Audible. Um, some of them are available on Amazon if you are part of the, I don't even know what it's called, Amazon subscription thing where you get to borrow books or rent books or whatever they call it. But most of my books are very cheap on Amazon especially. Again, you can find them all at jlpoker.com slash books. Is it worth a two-hour drive, four-hour round trip to play three to four hours of one to no limit? I guess you mean based on your return on investment. If you can play one to no limit, you're really good. You may make 20 or 30 bucks an hour. So if you have to spend eight hours to make, let's call you a $20 an hour winner, eight hours to make $80, is that worth it? You make 10 bucks an hour minus expenses. Probably not worth it, right? Um, yesterday, someone on Instagram, I posted a post. I don't remember what he was replying to. But basically what he said is that I wrote it down so I make sure, make sure I don't get this wrong. He said that most of the top 50 money winners in poker would not be in the top 50 if you took out their biggest score. Then he cited a few people who final tabled the World Series of Poker. Um, you know, just name any World Series poker winner. And so that did not seem right to me. So I did a little bit of diligence. It took me two seconds. And everyone he listed was not even in the top 100. Okay? And... Um, the one person who was, was a main event winner. So clearly that person should be high up on the money list. And he was like number 91, right? So if the main event winner is number 91, not exactly sure what this guy was talking about. So I said, looking at the top 50 winners, if you remove their top score, that's just not accurate, right? You, you said something that's factually not true. So I'm trying to help this guy out, right? He's, he's speaking without actually knowing what he's talking about. Okay. He then replied that... Um, Poker players can't do um, derivatives, is what he was saying, and, um, and and calculus. And funny enough, I've actually passed calculus. I haven't, I haven't passed a whole lot of college classes, but calculus is one of them. But it's irrelevant, right? Now this guy's trying to prove his intellect. And I think you're, you're going to find on social media, a lot of the time people are trying to prove how smart they are, as opposed to trying to learn things they do not know. And that's an interesting mindset, because you actively want to be proven wrong if you're trying to improve yourself. Because if you're always being proven right, it implies that you're not really progressing or challenging yourself to some extent. And it's important to realize you do not know it all. No one knows it all. Get that out of your mind. You do not know everything about everything. So anyway, whenever this person was challenged with facts, he got offended and decided to try to insult my and every other poker player's intellect. And the question is, why would someone do this? And how do you make sure you do not have this behavior yourself? Because it's definitely not a good way to progress as a human. And I think it really comes from the mindset of, I am trying to improve my life. And I'm trying to improve the life, lives of other people. And trying to stroke your ego is pointless. And you need to be very secure with yourself to understand that you do not know everything. A lot of people think they know everything, but they don't, is what it amounts to. And you want to make sure that if you are trying to progress in life and succeed long term, you need to seek out people who know more than you, and you need to seek out truth and the facts. And now truth is, is sometimes subjective, of course. People have different perceptions. But saying something like, if you removed the top score of the top 50 poker players, then they would not be in the top 50 money on the, on the money list. It's just not true. And then I even looked through the top 50 players, and of the top 50, three of them I thought were... I, I thought I was better... Again, my perception. I thought I was better than three of them. 
Three out of 47, right? This is me looking at these players as a good poker player, right? I don't think I'm a fish by any means. And I believe all of these players are like very, very good, very world-class, very top-notch, which makes a lot of sense because to be in the top 50 of the all-time money list, you either have to have like won the main event or won the main event plus something, right? Or you need to have um, been a super high roller player for a while. And anyway, whenever you're proven to be wrong, how should you reply, right? You should not reply by being offended and by trying to say that you now know something else that is completely irrelevant to the topic at hand. That'd be like saying, um, in order to be a good poker player, like say, say I'm, a, I'm a real in shape guy and I can run a six minute mile. And you know running a six minute mile is great for your poker, or you think it is, because it gives you more stamina. You can say something like what this guy said, I think the top 50 poker players are fish and it's all luck. And then you can say, well, I can run a six minute mile. Like, yeah, who cares? You know, it doesn't matter. I can do, I, I have 17 degrees from all the Ivy League schools. Like, who cares? It doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. Anyway, don't try to stroke your ego. Be secure with yourself, be confident with yourself. And understand though, you don't know everything and always try to progress. Can you add a calling it all in quiz to the float to turn app? We're actually, oh wait, um, is that not available already? I presume it's not because you're asking me for it. Where's my pen? Michael, I know you, um, send me a message on Twitter and I'll, I'll forward that to the, the developer. We have all sorts of things planned for the app, by the way. We are actually trying to figure out how to accurately calculate the big blind, how to adjust to the big blind ante because no one really knows it yet. Because it requires you to take future games or future hands into account. ICMizer does this. Um, and even they say it's not accurate, their, their, their program. Because it's really hard to account for the future. And you can account for this specific hand. But, like I said, right, if you know you're going to lose, uh, lose your, big blind, your one big blind to the ante next hand, it, it just really, really, really screws you, right? Anyway, um, William says that that is available. William says that the Push Fold app does have a calling quiz. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Go, go check it out. I, I, don't have, I, can't use, I can't look right now because I'm streaming on Instagram. A lot of players like Fader Holtz and Jeff Gross say meditation is really good for your game. Yeah, a lot of people swear by meditation. I think I've been asked this every day. I think since we started a little poke, a little coffee and um, no, I do not meditate. I do things that I find to be very meditative. They get me in the zone. I understand that my brain is rather fragmented and I have a hard time with it. I definitely do try to, before I go play a poker tournament, I sit there and try to clear my mind. Like I try to make sure I have no work going on, right? I try to make sure that I can focus on whatever the task at hand is. Maybe Fedor and Jeff have more things going on in their life and they, they need to actually act, actively clear their mind. I more so sit there for just a few minutes and take care of all my work. How much looser do you play in bounty tournaments? It depends on if you can collect bounties. If you can't collect the bounties, then it doesn't matter. It also depends on how large the bounties are. Right? If the bounty is irrelevant, like let's say you're playing a $100 tournament with a $20 bounty, the $20 bounty essentially doesn't matter. But if the bounty is half of a stack, like say you're playing a progressive tournament on party poker where you get infinite money if you bust someone, well then clearly you need to be going after that bounty whenever you can. There's actually a, a bounty calculator for progressive bounties at Rob Tenyon's site, max-ev.com. I don't know if it's free or not, but it's there. Do you have any tips for keeping track of people's stack size while you're playing? Practice. Practice a lot. Practice at home. You know, get, get, get chip stacks across the table from you and see if you can count them. Put a pile of random chips in the pot and see if you can count it. Also, get really good at understanding what a chip stack looks like. Uncle Eddie Mantel in the chat. Hello, Uncle Eddie again. Yesterday, Uncle Eddie told me that he got on the Instagram and then... Only, he didn't want to watch because he was walking. He wanted to put it in his pocket and listen. He clicked on the side of his phone and it turned it off and then he couldn't find me again. But he found me again. Welcome back, Uncle Eddie. Let's see. Other questions. Can you get my advice on winning a big pot against a fellow regular friend and what is the etiquette in that situation? Depends on your um, your behaviors and your, your, your um, relationship with your friend, right? Assuming this is actually your friend and that you're cool with each other, you can laugh at the guy and joke at the guy and make fun of the guy. 
if you feel as if you have done a bad thing, you probably need to stop feeling that way. You have to understand, whenever you are gambling and playing a game like, well, any game, quite often the goal is to win. Now, if you win, why would you feel bad if you were achieving the goal that everyone is trying to achieve? You should not feel bad. So you shouldn't do anything. I just don't do anything when I win the pots. I, I collect the chips and move on with my life. But I definitely do not think you need to say you're sorry or anything like that. Um, Goose says you can slow roll your friends. Yeah, do whatever you want if that's the kind of friends you have. It's probably the best kind of friends you have because you're not taking the game personally and you're probably all properly bankrolled, so you don't really care that much. Which is the best kind of friends. But if you know your friend is playing for his last bit of rent money and you take your friend's last bit of rent money and you know you're going to go spend it on shoes and he needed it to get rent and now he's going to get kicked out of his house, well, your friend should not be playing the game. And also, if you feel that bad about it, Give him his money back. No one's saying you can't give the guy his money back. Which books have changed my life? Mm. This book here has been very beneficial. The 4-Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. It doesn't actually teach you how to work 4 hours a week. It teaches you how to be very, very productive so that you can get 40 hours worth of work done in a week. Now, it's a little bit of an overstatement. You can't get 4 hours work done, or 40 hours of work done in a week. But... This is why I'm here today with all of you. So thanks to Tim Ferriss for that. I also love all the other, the other Tim Ferriss books. I think they're excellent. Um, check it out. Four Hour Workweek. If you want to, well, escape nine to five, live anywhere, and join the new rich. Sounds like a plan. New rich, though, is an interesting idea because essentially you don't have to have a ton of money. You have to just make sure you use your resources well and intelligently. A lot of people think I need lots of money to do things, but in reality... If you actually price out how much stuff costs to do and to, uh, you can rent a lot of stuff essentially, right? Like let's say um, you live in Manhattan and you want to have an upstate, you want to have an upstate um, bungalow, right? Ask yourself, how often are you really going to use that upstate bungalow? Maybe you're going to use it twice a year. Well, why, why buy a place? Why not just rent a place? That way you don't have, to have a lot of money locked down. If you're not using it as an investment because you don't think it's going to go up necessarily, um, why do you need that, right? Just rent what you need. Say you think you need a nice fancy watch because your friend has a nice fancy watch. Well, you need to get that out of your mind, right? Just because somebody else has a nice fancy watch does not mean you need to have that. And desiring things will often make you very poor. I'm trying to think of this quote. I, for I forget it off the top of my head. It's something to the effect of being rich is essentially not having many desires. And it's kind of true. You can see me becoming a motivational speaker. I, am, I don't know if I'm a motivational speaker or not, but if you all want me to come motivate you all, I'm happy to do it. Um, I read a lot. Someone asked me how many books I have. I don't know if they meant my books or someone else's books. All my books are right up here. We have 14 books that are mine or I'm involved with. Well, a few that I'm involved with you all. I, I, I'm very, very tangentially involved in, like um, Mike Sexton's biography, for example. I got him his book deal with my publisher. And, um, but anyway, 14 books of mine. I have another one I'm going to be working on soon, Excelling at Online No Limit Holding with the Pokar Backing Group. I'm really, really excited about that. Uh, who was it? Striker Poker says, Tim Ferriss taught you how to make the best coffee. Here I am having coffee Tim Ferriss style, the way he taught, taught me to make it. I've learned a lot from Tim Ferriss. Would you bust my grandma at poker? Definitely, you're trying to bust everyone at poker. What would I suggest to someone who has limited time but wants to get better at the game? What's a good ratio to playing ratio, etc., etc.? Um, if you don't have much time, you need to make sure you're actively using your time and you're using it well. So I would ask, what are you doing with your time right now to where you don't have much time? Maybe the answer is you have a job, you have a family. And that, that's it. I mean, I know I have way less free time now than I used to. I used to play Magic the Gathering and Hearthstone and just hang out, <laughs> right? That's, that's what I did two or three hours a day. But now I'm spending time with my baby. And that sort of makes it to where you don't have a lot of free time, right? So you need to get on a program, essentially. You need to get discipline. What I would probably do, well, not to toot my own horn, I would sign up to PokerCoaching.com. Um, go, go there, go through all the quizzes, go through all the homework. Maybe sign up for the inner circle where you can ask me your questions with you know actual hand histories where we can go through it and take our time. 
can't really do that here because it's hard to go through hand histories in this format because you're looking at me and not at my computer screen. But get on a program, whatever that means. Maybe you decide to sign up to a site like Run It Once. I think that's a great training site. They have lots lots of high quality videos. I think that's a good thing to do. Um, I would ask, do are you already a consistent winner in the game? Do you feel as if when you play you are profiting? You, you should probably know this if you're keeping results, as you definitely should. And if you're already winning at poker and you want to win more, understand you have to give up some money now, which you could be the time you could be playing in exchange for getting better. And that may just be something you have to do. Monster says, you thought I didn't drink coffee. Today's a business meeting day. I have lots going on. On days where I need to be very, very with it, we have coffee. That is poker days and that is meeting days. As you see, I'm wearing my big boy shirt today. What's my favorite snack to eat? I don't really eat many snacks. We don't snack. My baby James doesn't snack. Someone says, how many times does he eat a day? We say three plus two, two glasses of milk each day. And they said, he doesn't have any snacks? No, he doesn't, he doesn't snack. I don't really snack. I only, I only eat food. I've been really into bone broth recently. It's probably not healthy for me to have bone broth with um, four cubes of sweet potato in it for dinner, but I've been having that for lunch or dinner. I don't know if that's necessarily a snack. But um, I like bone broth. It's probably not what you all were thinking I would say, but that is the answer to the question. I like bona fide bone broth. Olivia Bousquet posted on Twitter, is there a way to make bone broth taste good? I've had a few and they were just like awful. I don't know what bona fide does, but there's, they probably put a little bit of salt in it, honestly. It's probably what the answer to what they do. But that's what I do. That's what I like. Speaking of having free time, I wanted to talk about hobbies. See how I have these little note cards everywhere? I have lots of these. I actually have a nice little pile building up over there. I'm probably going to write a book out of all these topics because these are all good topics. Um, hobbies. What's the purpose? Right? Is the purpose to just spend your time doing something you enjoy? Is the purpose to get away from your real, regular life? Is Like, what is the purpose of your hobby? Um, you should definitely enjoy your hobby. Make sure you like it. I know some poker players who bet on sports all the time, and they think that that's their hobby, but they hate it, and they're miserable the whole time because they're not good at it, and they lose. <laughs> that's not a good hobby. That's a bad hobby. I think you need to find hobbies, preferably, that can somehow make money or at least break even. Very, very important, especially when you care about money. Most people care about money until they're filthy rich. So find a hobby that does not light your money on fire. Ideally, these are not requirements. These are ideal. Find a hobby that doesn't light your money on fire. Often also find a hobby that is very different from your job, right? If you're a poker player, which is playing a mind game, your hobby should probably not be playing another mind game. I'm talking to myself right now because my hobby is playing Magic the Gathering, which is difficult, just like poker is difficult. And that's not a good hobby. Good hobbies for poker players in particular are things like going to the gym. Because in poker, you often cannot control the results. Unless you find a way to put in massive amounts of volume. And even then, you don't control the results, right? So with things like working out, you very actively control the results, right? You get to pick how hard you work out. You can stick to a regimen. You can go down. You can do it. You can feel productive. Et cetera, et cetera. And... Working out is free, or at least very cheap, right? I mean, you can go to a park and do pull-ups on a bar and, and get in fantastic shape. There's a book called Convict Conditioning. It was apparently designed by a guy who was in prison who wanted to be able to do workouts with no equipment or minimal equipment. And if you think about the life of a traveling poker player, you're in a hotel room a lot, which is similar but different from a prison cell. So, convict conditioning. Essentially, you want to do, I'm probably going to get this wrong because I read this book 10 years ago. You want to do pull-ups. You want to do squats. You want to do handstands. You want to do back bends. What were the other ones? Maybe sit-ups, but that doesn't seem right. That seems too easy. I forget. There are two, two other exercises. There were six exercises all together. I got to where I could do all of them pretty well. They go through progressions for ways you can do it harder. Um, planks. Okay, there we go. Strikers getting it. Planks. Yeah, planks is it. 
And deadlifts. Uh, no, not deadlifts. Deadlifts require a bar. These are all these exercises require nothing. Um, for for pull ups, by the way, you get a door at a hotel room and you put a towel over it and you can do pull ups against the door. So all you need is a door to do all this. At what point do you consider going all in in poker when you got your results to back it up? That's a difficult question. It depends on your life. Some sodium, uh, bone broths have high, host, high sodium. I definitely agree. What's a good sample size of hours in determining your skill? I, I actually, so funny enough, I have gotten asked a hundred times since I started a little coffee a week and a half ago, what, uh, like bankroll questions. And I decided to answer it. I have a blog post coming out next week on my website, jonathanlittlepoker.com. And essentially, I'm going to answer all of your bankroll questions there. I already wrote the article. It is 14 pages long. Uh, how, how long? I think it's 9,000 words. It's a lot of words. But, eh, you know, it's a bankroll article. You need, I call it the bankroll Bible. So that is going to be on my site in one week, jlpoker.com slash blog. Every week, by the way, I post a blog post of some type. If you have not checked it out, go there. Let me know what you think. I posted, I posted a blog every week for the last, like, three years now. So check it out. Let's see. If you had pocket delvers, would you flip them and show the table your insectile aberrations? Um, I'll show you what I do whenever I'm playing magic. Let's see. Where are they? Give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Someone wants to play magic cards. I'll show you how I play with my magic cards. Let's see if I even have a deck put together. I don't know if I do or not, actually. I took apart Delver a while back. Let's make sure my camera's not completely screwed up. Oh my god, I screwed up the camera so bad. All right, let's get this camera back fixed. All right, everyone's messing up my setup just so we can play our magic cards. I think I have a legacy deck in here. Just one that. What is all this junk? Delvers. Here's a Delver. Here's a Delver. This is what my hobby is. Woo, it's so fun! I just play with the Delvers like this. Someone asked on uh, over here. So we have the Delver in the sleeve, right? And then you just get it out and you turn it around. Here's the insectile aberration. If we have pocket Delvers, we have two of them, right? There they are. You just take them out and you flip them. That is how I go about playing with my pocket Delvers. And um, I don't use the uh, little check card. I think little check card's silly. Always double sleeve your cards if you are a professional adult because People will spill stuff on them. If I took my little, if I took this and dipped this in my coffee right now, it would not get wet. The card would be perfectly fine because it is in two sleeves. You see, there's, it's in a sleeve here and it's in a sleeve here. Magic cards. Ooh, we can always talk about magic cards. All right, what else? There are not good. Is there not a good leg, legacy community in my city? There is a good legacy community in, Mad, in uh, Manhattan, but I don't get to play because I have a child. What are those scribbles on it? Ooh, these are signatures. I love signed magic cards. This is probably my little silly obsession. The, whoever uh, drew this card, Nils Hom, is the artist. He drew this picture. He drew this nifty picture. And he signed it. I'll show you all something else I really love. Let's see if I can find it. Ooh, it's so fun. I also really love altered magic cards, like this, for example. You see how this has this blue thing on the, in the middle of it? This is drawn by the artist on the card. It's quite neat. Let's see. We have other cards, right? We have um, this land. This may look like a regular underground sea, but it's been drawn on by the artist very subtly to make it look slightly different, you know? Here's a not so subtle one. We have a mock sapphire. Right? But it's been altered by the artist. The artist has drawn on it. A dragon. They've drawn a dragon on it. Whee! So, this is what I do with my spare time. <laughs> WK, WFKS says, see what you all did? You ruined the, you ruined the stream. Yep, you, ruined, you all ruined the stream. Anyway, there's my hobby. They sit behind me all the time. All right, let's find some more questions. Is there a community of poker players that play Magic together? Um, there used to be in Vegas, but I think everyone moved. How old am I? I'm 30. 
33 or 34? I started playing when I was 18. What makes Magic so close to poker? It is a game of known and unknown information, just like, um, just like poker is, right? You know what your opponent bet, but you don't know what their cards are. Um, Magic has a little bit more known information than poker, which makes it um, more skill intensive than poker for the most part. But that's okay. Uh, that's the reason no one plays Magic for money, right? There's actually a big issue right now in professional Magic that professional Magic players don't make significant money. And that's the problem with most games of skill, right? Is that if I know I'm obviously better than you, why in the world would I want to play with you for money? Poker's cool. <laughs> cool. Poker's good to make a living from because it's often difficult to know your skill level compared to your opponents. All right, let's go back and see what these people... The best poker player at Magic is Antonio Esfandiari. Sure. Should play Magic Live. Um, the prison book was called Convict Conditioning. Chat, chat says, uh, hiking, is your mental, hiking is your mental escape. Yeah, that's a great thing. Hiking is a great one. All right. What do I think about the Heartland Poker Tour structure? I do not know what the Heartland Poker Tour structure is. So I think we have Delvers within reach. Well, every responsible Magic player has at least four Delvers. I think I have 12 of them. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Where are, we? Where, are we? where are we going? Do I play live cash games these days? Not nearly as much as I used to. So I'll tell you all my schedule in the past. What I used to do is I would go to a poker tournament series. And then what I would do is I would play the daily tournament. They almost always start at noon, right? So the tournament starts at noon. And what I would do is I would play at noon, and then if I busted before about midnight, or I'm sorry, before 8 p.m. or so, I would play cash games until midnight, right? To make good use of my time. So I've played a tournament, I busted at like 3 p.m., I would go play cash games. Um, so fine and good, that's how life was. Now, what do I do? Well, now they have re-entry tournaments, which makes it to where you don't really go broke so quickly, right? If you bust at 3 p.m., you can buy in again, usually until 6 or 7 or 8 p.m. So, typically you don't actually bust for most tournaments until 8 or 9 p.m. at the earliest, assuming you come fully bankrolled and you plan to re-enter, right? So with re-entry tournaments existing, it makes it to where I don't have as much time to play cash games when I play the tournament circuit. So, now I'm only playing cash games when I get invited to a good home game or a televised show. Like I played um, 2550 on Poker Night in America a while back. That went great. Um, then I also played a 510 game with the winners of Survivor. Somehow me and five winners of Survivor played 510 No Limit and I won literally every hand. You want to talk about feeling bad about winning? I felt bad about winning. Because <laughs> I won literally every hand. I got smacked by the deck and I played well and they all played poorly. I, they didn't all play poorly, but some of them played not so great. It was like they'd never played poker, you know, was their, they were just getting on TV to, to play for fun. And I felt so bad. I just won literally every pot. Um, so what I did, you know, you want to talk about feeling bad about things like this. After that, we all went out to dinner, and I paid for a large chunk of the dinner. I think I was up about $1,500 or something, and the dinner was 1000 so I think I just paid the dinner. You know, Whatever was Tyson at the table. Tyson was at the table. Tyson was on my direct left. They actually told us specifically before the show, if you have a conversation, have a whole a conversation with the whole table. Don't just talk to the person next to you. Tyson, for some reason, demanded to talk to exactly me like half the time. And you know, I'm not going to be a jerk. I'm going to talk back. And so multiple times the producer had to come out and say to me and Tyson, you got to stop talking to each other. You have to talk to, talk to the whole table. It was funny. How do you adapt to a low VPIP cash games? It, uh, just you just start stealing more. Yeah, people are tight. Realize that most of your equity is going to come from just stealing blinds. I mean, this happened a lot at 1020 No Limit when I used to play there at Bellagio a lot. What would happen is um, the table was very tight, right? They didn't defend their defend their blinds well, and when they did defend, they often just check folded. So I raised free flop. Big blinds would call. They check fold, right? You're not going to get rich playing this game. Well, you will get rich playing this game, but you won't have big big wins. So you have to make sure you don't stack off poorly because they're always going to have way better hands than you. And um, 
you just steal a lot of blinds and realize that your equity comes from stealing the blinds three times for orbit. And that's, that's most of your profit. Am I making 40% on each re-entry? Depends on the buy-in and depends on the game, right? Uh, it's very important to realize that if you're playing a $25,000 tournament, no one's making 40%. But if you're playing a $500 tournament, lots of people are making 40%. Was Garrett Adelstein playing? I only played with the winners of Survivor. I've played with Garrett a few times. Um, and he is, he's an absolute character. I played with Garrett for a long time. Like, we, we played at LA, in LA a decent chunk. I went to the LAPC one time and just stayed there for something like a month and a half. And um, I played with him like every day or, or often. And he played like that back in the day too. What do you think about his playing style? It's maniacal. When you re-enter a tournament, um, do you look at it like you're entering a brand new tournament? Yes. So if you have a 40% ROI, do you have 40% ROI on each buy-in? No. I discuss this in my bankroll article coming out in a week. Um, essentially, your ROI goes down as the structure of the tournament gets worse. This is a very, very well-known thing. So, actually, if your ROI is negative, it gets better as the structure is worse. So if you're really bad at poker, you should be buying in late. Anyway, um, your ROI goes down as the structure is worse. So when you're buying in late, you're essentially buying into a tournament where you have 50 big blinds instead of 200, or 15 big blinds instead of 200, and that drastically affects your return on investment. Poker player John Robert Blonde, uh, yeah, he, he was on Survivor a while back too. There have been three poker players that were, that claimed to be poker players on, on the show. They had um, John Robert, and then they had Garrett, and then they had um, Anna Kate, I think is her name, or something like that. Survivor starts tomorrow. Yeah, new new episode, new season of Survivor starts tomorrow. I love Survivor. I watch all of them. Uh, speaking of not watching a whole lot of TV, but having you know having hobbies, I like Survivor. Survivor's a good game. I would definitely go out there and play it. So hello to all the producers of Survivor. Please pick me to come play. This is my one hour long audition tape. Against low VPIP players, out of position, low connected board. How much do we continuation bet? Depends on the opponent. You'll find that some players will always call small bets. Some people will always hold a big bet unless they have something. If you want them floating a lot, bet small. If you want them folding a lot, bet big. It, it depends a lot on the player, though. Typically, though, in that scenario, you often are going to want to... Well, let's see. Against a low VPIP player out of position. How much, so you're saying they that we're first to act? If we're first to act, that means they called on the button or something like that. Um, you probably need to be checking a decent amount if they play mostly good cards to start with because they should not fold that often on the flop. We says he likes Big Brother. I've never watched Big Brother. I feel like Big Brother is a little bit more too drama heavy. I'm, I'm not a big fan of absurd drama. Sure, Survivor has absurd drama sometimes, but I guess I just don't view it to be as absurd. I don't know. Anyway, this question that HSOE is asking is very broad, right? And these are the kind of questions we tackle at PokerCoaching.com in the homework. I would say, you raise from middle position. What is your range, right? You need to know, plus or minus a few hands, what your middle position opening range looks like with 100 big blinds, okay? Only a tight player on the button calls. Flop comes through 6-3-2. What is your strategy with each part of your range? So, which hands are we betting? First off, which hands are we betting and which hands are we checking? Next, are we using a strategy where we bet big with some hands and bet small with some hands? You may decide to bet the same size with everything, which is often what I think most people do. Although they mix it up sometimes. Usually they have two sizings. Most people don't have more than two sizings if they're playing well because it's really hard to implement a balanced strategy with three or five or seven sizings because then, like say you have seven sizings, you have to make sure they're all balanced and that's really hard to do. Assuming you're trying to play well, right? We're trying to find the baseline default solution. Uh, you mentioned that we're playing against a tighter player, pre-flop which means you're going to have stronger hands than average when he makes it to the flop. So we would discuss that, right? We'd say, what does this guy's range look like? Is, do we expect him to fold a lot, et cetera, et cetera. Then, okay, we bet, let's say we bet small with part of our range and we check some of our range. I would say, okay, we bet small. What does that do to your range? Well, first it gets rid of all of your checks, right? So now your range just lost a part of it. We get to the turn. What do you do with that part of your range? Let's turn to 10 of clubs, right? Whatever. Um, what do we do with our range now? And, I, and you would say what you do. Let, and I'm going to say, let's say we check. So that gets rid of your betting range, right? So now we're left with our flop betting range, turn checking range, which is going to get narrower and narrower and narrower, right? And this is what we do at PokerCoaching.com. But these, this takes people four hours to do. It's not, a, it's not a simple question of 
how do you play this spot? I mean, that's not how poker in life works. This takes a long time to, to solve these questions. All right, when 20, you're 28, do you think it is a good time to start playing poker? No. You, have a lot of ex you, you don't have a lot of experience, but you would like to seek it to be, become a professional. What's your advice? Basically, I would tell you to play the game for fun and enjoyment and see if you are actually winning money. If you don't play poker at all or very little and you're not winning money, you probably just don't need to get in it. Most poker players aren't going to tell you this, but um, it's true. Speaking of most poker players having very, very, I don't want to say devious is the right word, but they have um, incentives to get you to play and they get you to play. They would tell you something like, yeah, hop in, go for it. You can, you can definitely do it. But in reality, most poker players don't make money, right? Because of the rake and because they're just not good. So you have to be very, very good to start with. You just told me you have no experience or little experience. And you're already 28, so you probably have something going on in life. And it's just not a good thing to get into, into I don't think. Unless, unless you do it as a hobby, right? Find yourself a hobby. And that's it. Eddie Mantel says, just met a fan who bought my books. Sweet. <laughs> just signed up for poker coaching. Absolutely love it. And taking your time going through the webinar is good. Do you have any suggestions for the sequence? Go back to the first webinar you've ever that I ever made. Start there. Work your way towards current. JMFG, good morning, welcome. Which poker sites do I recommend? Definitely the major ones. Um, Party Poker and Poker Stars are by far the main sites. You will always get paid. They're big publicly traded companies and you'll be fine on those. You're 28, oh wait, you're 28 years old and quit a job to start playing poker full time. You can do it. So I'm a rounder, did it? P Man says, "What American sites? Listen, we discussed. Maybe I need to write an article on this too. I get this question every day. Basically, I suggest you play on the American sites if you have no other options, and you keep put, put a very small amount of money on there, like fifty dollars, and realize that you are essentially paying to get experience against players who also care. Right? You don't want to play play money games because no one cares. Um, you want to be playing against people who are playing." For real, right? And whenever you put money on these um, unregulated sites that operate within America, you're probably not gonna get your last cash out. So keep that in mind. Don't keep significant money in there on there because you're probably not gonna get your last cash out. All right, let's see. If anyone has if no one has any more questions, we're gonna wrap it up for today. I don't have anything else to talk about. By the way. If you all have um, topics you want me to address, or if you're watching the replay of this, I know you all are watching the replay of this, some people do. Hello to everyone on the replay. <laughs> um, send me a message. You can send me a message on basically all the platforms that this is being streamed on besides Twitch, I think. It's best if you send me the message on Twitter. I will definitely see it there. I don't check Facebook so often. Also, Facebook chat's not working. I don't know why Facebook chat and Twitch chat are not working, but I guess it is what it is. Where should you move if you want to be a professional poker player online? doesn't really matter where you move to, right? You just need to make sure you have good, reliable internet and, preferably, low cost of living. Is Toronto cheap? I imagine it's probably not. I imagine most major cities are probably not cheap. What's the absolute minimum of big blinds you will late register with? That depends on the tournament, Double G. I discussed this in the bankroll chapter coming, or the bankroll Bible coming up in the uh, next week. But essentially, you're not going to have much of a positive ROI with something like 20 big blinds or less. So that's often the answer. Unless the term is real, real, real soft or the rake is really, really low. Uh, what do I think of a 100% continuation bet for one third pot sizing when you three bet out of position? Seems like a fine generic strategy, but definitely leaves money on the table. What online games would I recommend to play that are profitable? They're all profitable. Cash game, tournament, sitting goes, whatever. Problem with sitting goes is you can't play a ton of volume. What's the difference between my sites? Float to Turn has a lot of videos. We're actually um, ramping down Float to Turn. If you're a poker coaching member, you get Float to Turn for free. It's included. Um, so Float to Turn just has a lot of training videos, like most of the other poker sites, so we decided to innovate some. Poker Coaching has quizzes and homework. Inner Circle has, is, a, is an add-on to Poker Coaching. If you have Inner Circle, you also have Poker Coaching and Float to Turn. Inner Circle has office hours where you can call in once every two weeks and I'll answer your questions for 15 minutes. I do that for whoever wants to call in. 
And um, it also has many webinars where you suggest specific topics, like that question I was just asked, you know, how do you play when you raise preflop and a type layer calls? I would go through that spot for you in the inner circle if you were an inner circle member. So that's what we do there. You need to be playing huge to live in Toronto to make it worth it. Yeah, because it's probably expensive, right? Is a 10% rake, $6 max, $1 for bad beat. Is that standard? No, that is high. Um, high compared to Vegas, standard for South Florida, I think. Can you download the quizzes? No, the quizzes are all online, so you have to be online to do it. Quizzes are actually made by me making a lot of small individual videos, like three-minute videos, and we stitch them all together with buttons in between to where you have to say what you're going to do. What books or resources do you recommend to someone who's already crushing the mid-stakes limit hold'em but wants to take their game to the next level? I don't know. I don't know anything about limit hold'em books. The quizzes are unreal, says H-S-O-E. Sorry, I don't know how to say this. Not even going to try. Um, yeah, the quizzes are good. We spend a lot of time making them work. If you're beating mid-stakes limit, there really aren't a whole lot of resources out anymore. Limit hold'em is essentially thought to be a solved game. There is a book by this guy, Stocks Trader. I forget his name off the top of my head. It's a blue book. Something to the effect of winning in tough limit hold'em games or something to that extent. Um, that's probably something you should look into. You're about to become a blackjack dealer. Any tips for you? I don't know anything about being a blackjack dealer. What do I think of Ben CB's Raise Your Edge course? I've not taken Ben CB's course, but I've watched a bunch of Ben CB videos. He is a coach for the Pokar backing company, which I am a part owner of, and I've watched... Every video he's made, and they're all good. So I presume that his course is good, too. Do I play mixed games slash PLO? I play proficiently, in my mind, so probably pretty good. No Limit Hold'em, PLO, Limit Hold'em, and that's it. I also am competent enough at Omaha 8 or better, Deuce to 7 triple draw, and the other games I do not know how to play because I never play them. I, we just, I discuss this a lot, that I don't really play to play. A lot of people think that you play to have fun, right? And at this point in my life, I don't really have time to be playing lots of random games just to play them. Like, I just don't load up the poker site and play limit seven card stud for an hour to pass the time, right? That's not what I'm doing with my life right now. So now I, I, I don't have a reason to play these games. You may say, well, you can play the tournaments during the World Series. And that is true, but it's only like three tournaments. So it's not really worth a large time investment. The Nuts Man says, you used to play for Pokar. Nice. What time are you on in the morning? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Speaking of 9 a.m. Eastern Time, it's already 10 a.m. So, I have to go. On Instagram, you can only stream for one hour. They cut you off after an hour. So, goodbye, everyone. Um, we'll be back tomorrow, 9 a.m. Eastern 9 a.m. Yeah, I can't talk. 9 a.m. Eastern Time. We talk about poker coaching a lot in this um, a little coffee, so check that out. Oh, what? Gary, 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 bring James in here real quick. Let's get my baby in here real quick. Eddie Mantel's on the line, too. Come here, James, come here. Let's show you them a sick baby. Let's show, let's show Oh, here's the sick baby. James is sick today. Can you say hello? Can I kiss? You're so nice. Oh, he likes my headphones. No, 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 no. Here's James. We love him. He's sickly. You can hear him breathing. It's so sad. Okay, go take a nap. You go take a nap. You're a good boy. You're a good boy. You're a good, good boy. I love you. Bye-bye. Can you say bye-bye? It's okay. You don't have to shut it. Right, right. Everyone says, get better, James. We love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, that's it for today. Have a good time. Enjoy yourselves. Be nice to each other. I lost my mouse. Who's Gary? Gary is my father-in-law. He's a very, very good man. We love Gary. Gary watches James on Mondays and Tuesdays. All right, that's it for today. Have fun. Be nice to someone. Enjoy yourselves. See you tomorrow, 9 a.m.